Um, I'd like to start. Um, my name is Lee Chen Sim, and um, uh, my co-presenter is uh, Fahod, who you'll see on the screen. And we are going to start today with our presentation on the geoeconomics um, uh, and Central Asia's Asia-Pacific Outlook. Um, because um, uh, Dr. Sahakian has uh, mentioned that we have 10 minutes in the presentation, so we have actually truncated our paper um, to focus specifically on one aspect of geoeconomics, and that's on energy. Um, uh, we will also be looking at the specific cases of the southern neighbors of Central Asia, um, we're looking at them be, uh, for this particular presentation because we feel that um, for the purpose of the 10 minutes, um, they are the most direct gateway to Indo-Pacific, so we will just um, look a bit more closely at them. And for our framework, uh, we are going to offer that the Central Asian states um, have increased their agency uh, from about the 1990s with respects to the engagement with the Indo-Pacific and that uh, today uh, they have evolved uh, from being mere policy takers to actually something which we call policy shakers. Um, although we will also point out that Central Asia in this respect are not yet policy shapers. So I hope our presentation will make sense to you and I'll hand over the first bit to my um, co-author Fahot. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Li Chen. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so basically, we are talking about Central Asia and Indo-Pacific. But how can Central Asian countries reach Indo-Pacific when Central Asian region is a landlocked region, right? And of course, we have to go through South Asia first. And as the first step, basically, we are looking at the relationships between Central Asian countries, Afghanistan, and then Pakistan as a gateway to Indo-Pacific. And the moment uh, Central Asian countries reach um, um, Indian Ocean, then of course, they have a wide range of possibilities to develop and strengthen their economic relationships. Uh, you know, um, first of all, and then um, a wide range of basically relationships, uh, uh, security, political, financial uh, uh, relationships with a number of regions from all over the world. All right, so, and um, we, we are all familiar, familiar with the importance of energy for Central and South Asian countries. So we decided to make energy relationship as the cornerstone kind of, you know, a uh, pillar of these two countries, um, you know, um, interstate relationships. Um, with the breakdown of the Central Asian energy system, which happened in the begin in the mid 2000s, Central Asian countries, they started looking for an alternative market. And uh, Afghanistan, as well as the broader South Asian region turned out to be a very attractive market destination for Central Asian energy resources. A number of projects were put in place uh, uh, and supported both by Central Asian countries, South Asian countries, and multilateral institutions in the region. Um, electricity, transmission lines, natural gas pipelines, as well as fuel trade, uh, all of these energy relationships, they became basically the driving force uh, uh, behind strengthening relationships between Central Asian countries and South Asian countries and for Central Asian states to diversify their dependence on Russia and China. Next slide, please. Yeah, and, and, and here on this map, you can have a kind of, you know, a visual representation of how Central Asian countries are trying to basically, uh, basically develop their relationships uh, uh, toward southern direction and reach um, Indian Ocean. There is a number of projects, uh, energy projects in, in this sense. Two top, which is Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan transmission line. TAP, which is Turkmen Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan electricity transmission line. Uh, CASA 1000, Central Asia, South Asia transmission line. 
Tapi, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India natural gas pipeline, uh, along with the fuel trade, which is happening, and coal export from Central Asia to Afghanistan and from Afghanistan to Pakistan. And these relationships are basically kind of, you know, this trading relations are ongoing. Not all of these projects are, uh, uh, um, some of them are in the planning stage and not everything is going as smoothly as was expected at the very beginning due to a number of reasons, security, geopolitics, lack of financial resources. But having conducted a number of interviews with Central Asian representatives, uh, as well as you know, uh, um, uh, experts in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, we realized uh, how you know the extent of importance that the decision makers place uh, on those energy projects, and they believe that once those energy projects are in place, the relationships between Central Asia and South Asia will be strengthened, which then will have a spillover effect on other sectors of the economy. Next slide, please. So Central Asia and Afghanistan relations in particular. Right before we move on to Pakistan, we have to talk about Central Asia-Afghanistan relationship. After the regime takeover in 2021, there were a lot of speculations on where actually, you know, these relationships will take Central Asian countries. And despite the fact that uh, uh, the, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan is currently not being recognized by any of the Central Asian countries, if we look at the volume and uh, of electricity export to Central Asia, uh, the volume of and basically. Uh, um, the amount of uh, uh, agricultural goods, uh, industrial products being exported to Afghanistan, fueled trade uh, with Afghanistan, we can see with some ups and downs that this dynamic, uh, you know, these countries, they succeeded to maintain uh, stable relationships with Afghanistan. And in fact, there were several exchange of official meetings between Central Asian you know, uh, uh, officials and the Taliban regime. And the main issue on the agenda was to strengthen economic relationships between them. Play, uh, placing, placing energy relationships, uh, you know, at the front uh, lines. So uh, even, even with this increasing and very high debt that Af Afghan government, basically, uh, uh, the Taliban currently owes Central Asian uh, government for electricity and fuel, they understand, next slide please, Li Chen, they understand how important these relationships are then trying to pay their debts to Central Asian countries not to compromise these relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, Central Asian government officials, when we conducted interviews, they also acknowledged that for them, it's not really the debt, it's stable relationships with thousand neighbors which is more important uh, at the moment, which they are trying to maintain. Next slide. Um, uh, this is this is this is basically the trading relationships over, over the past several several years. Uh, uh, quantity and the volume of uh, import of electricity uh, by Afghanistan from Central Asian countries, as you can see with slight ups and downs. You know uh, um, the trend is there. Next slide, please. Once Central Asian countries, you know, cross the territory of Afghanistan, the next country is Pakistan, and Uzbekistan, with this new, with its new leadership, has been showing immense interest in Pakistan uh, and and strengthening relation economic relationships with Pakistan. In 2021, for the first time, Uzbekistan signed trade uh, uh, transit trade agreement. Uh, with Pakistan. And now they are trying to develop this triangular relationships, economic, geo-economic relationships between Central Asia, South Asia, and the Gulf countries. In 2022, Uzbekistan and Pakistan, they signed the preferential <coughs> trade agreement uh, uh, covering a wide range of goods, uh, uh, again, emphasizing the importance of South Asian markets for Central Asia. We are not saying that South Asia is becoming a priority for Central Asian countries in their foreign policy, foreign economic policy, but it is becoming one of the very important directions 
to diversify their existing kind of, you know, dependencies on their eastern and northern neighbors. Uh, uh, um, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, the, uh, the other two countries which are trying to strengthen their relationships with Pakistan, as well as Afghanistan, seeing these territories as a gateway to uh, um, in the Pacific, wider in the Pacific region. Uh, Alicien, the floor is back to you. We can't hear you, Lee Chen. Right. So um, I'd just like to conclude um, the presentation um, by just taking you through some of our, our framework. Um, we're looking at Central Asia in terms of um, the extent to which they are policy uh, rejectors, um, policy shapers, policy shakers. Um, and our conclusion is that they have evolved in their role. We're not saying that they actually make the policy in terms of engagement between Central Asia and Indo-Pacific when it comes to energy. Um, but what we're saying is that they're beginning to be policy shakers. They are shaking the existing policy structure through several ways, um, as you can see there on the slide, um, by increasing the supply of power. Um, that's what they're trying to do domestically, to, uh, increasing the supply of power to their own economies so that there is more power available to export to uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, as you've heard from my um, co-presenter. They've also tried to reduce the domestic consumption of power in Central Asia um, through tariff reforms and through upgrading transmission lines so that once again, there is more power available for export. They have also shaken the existing policies by actually engaging with non-traditional investment partners. So they're moving away from China. For example, Kazakhstan has a lot of um, energy trade with um, uh, the Chinese companies. Um, but right now they are trying to um, move towards or to diversify, to engage with the uh, uh, Gulf companies, Aqua and Mazda, and trying to build new uh, renewable power supplies. And finally, they are shaking up the policy as well by trying to engage more in intra-Central Asian um, energy trade um, because there is a difference between summer and winter requirements and capabilities uh, within Central Asia itself. So all of these things that they're trying to do is just with the goal primarily of trying to enable higher levels of electricity exports to their southern neighbors. So this is why we um, have uh, tried to conceptualize them as um, very uh, beginning stages of shaking the policy as opposed to being just mere um, policy takers. So with that, I will end um, our presentation um, well within time, I hope. And then I will hand off um, the presentation um, to our next presenter, um, whom I believe is um, Dr. Uh, Raman Valkochuk. Um, Raman, are you there in person? I don't see Raman there in person on the screen. Um, and I don't believe his online at the moment. Um, so perhaps um, we'll just go on to Dr. K. Hakada um, and uh, Dr. K. Hakada, the floor uh, is, uh, I hand the floor over to you. And Dr. Hakada would be speaking about um, mapping out Indo-Pacific plus strategies across terrestrial Eurasia, please. Okay, uh, thanks Li Chen for a uh, kind introduction. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kei Hakata. I'm speaking from Tokyo. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to uh, talk at this conference and thank uh, Dr. Sahakian for this wonderful opportunity. Let me uh, show the slide I've prepared. Let me wait for a second. Yes.
All right. Um, I focus on the language between the Indo-Pacific and uh, Eurasia while featuring the strategic dead corners of the Indo-Pacific idea. As other panelists will examine the dynamics in Central Asia with their expertise, my role will be limited to certain conceptual aspects. It has been a while since the Indo-Pacific debate has been underway. Seafaring democracies in Eastern Hemisphere have formulated strategies to preserve the rules-based international order. Such strategies also aim to counter the rise of China, which increasingly came to be regarded as a disruptor of the existing peaceful international order. The Indo-Pacific became the name of the game. The Indo-Pacific refers to a politically charged region and a new geostrategic concept to counterbalance China. It is also what my co-author and friend Brandon J. Cannon and I call a geographized political reality. The political reality made this concept more visible and revived, but it's a recent development. Like Eurasia, the Indo-Pacific is a century old concept, yet it has been much more eclipsed and its political emergence is quite recent. The 1990s was still the decade of the Asia Pacific. However, the Indo-Pacific emerged as a political reality in the 2000s. Strategists and policymakers began considering a wider maritime geography spanning the two oceans. Governments began using this term in their foreign policies. More importantly, the ongoing and great power competition between the United States of America and the People's Republic of China made the Indo-Pacific concept even more pronounced. Indeed, the Indo-Pacific is a main geographic theater of strategic competition and is a pivotal zone for this century. We must remember that the Indo-Pacific is precisely where China threatens the existing rules-based international order which makes the stakes high there. Contrary to many parts of inner Eurasia, China threatens it by persuasion and by force. China pursues global hegemonic ambitions coupled with coercive measures, particularly in East Asia. China's threats may not be noticeable to those far from China, but they are a real question to those who are very close like Japan or Taiwan. It is no doubt that uh, the rise of China has brought forward the Indo-Pacific idea. In response to China's hegemonism, various states have formulated Indo-Pacific strategies to preserve the rules-based international order. The Indo-Pacific is a geography of strategies as it conveys the strategic aspirations of various states against the revisionism of authoritarian regimes. It is also an ideational geography as it spells out the basis of what can be called a principled regionalism that is based on international law. The idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific, first advocated by Japan, aims precisely to shape such regionalism. The Indo-Pacific articulates aspirations of like-minded states. Australia, India, Japan, and the United States constitute the linchpins of the Indo-Pacific. They form a mineral grouping named the Quad. These like-minded states have found a window of opportunity in the Indo-Pacific to maintain the balance of power against the belligerent China. If the strategic nature of the Indo-Pacific is read between the lines, its hidden objective to counter China from both oceans become clear. In this sense, Indo-Pacific strategies are Eurasian strategies from the outer ring or through the back doors. And the reverse is true. Addressing terrestrial Eurasia will reinforce Indo-Pacific strategies from the back. Nonetheless, challenges exist in implementing the Indo-Pacific strategies. The so-called hedging middles are numerous. Such states consciously and comfortably adopt hedging strategies between Washington and Beijing. Another challenge is that 
uh, the Indo-Pacific as a geography is bounded and largely maritime. This leaves out highly strategic parts of the globe. Unlike China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is an all-encompassing geography, the Indo-Pacific is geographically limited, and it inevitably has many dead corners. For example, uh, these are Central Asia, which uh, my colleagues have just um, spoken about, Eastern Europe, Atlantic facing Latin America, and Central and West Africa. The United Nations is also a conceptual blind spot. The limited scope of the Indo-Pacific in no way equals to China's globally expanding diplomacy. If we wish to maintain a balance of power vis-a-vis -vis China, the Indo-Pacific states must expand their reach and give greater attention to larger spaces. Broader strategies, which can be called Indo-Pacific Plus, should be considered by Indo-Pacific states. The enlargement of the strategic scope is necessary, especially as China is consolidating its, uh, its place in Eurasia. This Chinese domination can be called Pax Eurasiana. It is a joint continental hegemony attempted by China with Russia as its junior partner. I resurrected this term first coined by a Russian art critic Pyotr Suvuchinsky in 1929, uh, who portrayed Russia's Eurasian identity. Suvuchinsky was a refugee in Paris. However, it is more appropriate to use it to describe China's increasing dominance in terrestrial Eurasia. It is therefore a Pax Sinica more focused on Eurasia. At the advent of Pax Eurasiana, the Indo-Pacific strategies are seem seemingly moving beyond the conventional geographical limits. Japan provides a good uh, example. In a meeting with Mongolian President Uhuna Hurelsu last month, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida emphasized the free and open Indo-Pacific, even if Mongolia is a landlocked country. Japan will also host a gathering of foreign ministers of Central Asia later this month in Tokyo. In April this month, in an online meeting with Central Asian counterparts, Japan's foreign minister already emphasized the freedom open Central Asia and the international order based on the rule of law. You see the language employed is identical to the free and open Indo-Pacific discourse. Indeed, we have to be realistic about the prospect of the Indo-Pacific maritime powers being involved in terrestrial Eurasia. Nevertheless, it will be a welcome development if they can create a situation of strategic multipolarity to dilute the authoritarian regime's influence. I understand the local governments and the people will welcome such a, um, such a scenario. The broadened Indo-Pacific strategies, regardless of whatever name is given, are certainly in line with the demands of the time. It remains to be seen how they will be put in practice. I stop here and thank you very much. So this is a reference. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Hakata. And um, thank you for the, um, you know, uh, giving us some of your thoughts about how the East Asian states um, are reaching out um, towards um, uh, Central Asia uh, in the uh, Indo-Pacific, trying to broaden the uh, scope and outreach. Um, without further ado, uh, we're now going to um, shift uh, the presentation. And um, according to what I have on my screen, um, the next presenter will be uh, Dr. Fakhot Talipov. Um, Fakhot, are you there in person? I don't see Fakhot in person on the screen, which I can see. Uh, and I, I do apologize for that. Um, perhaps he's got some um, technical difficulties and may join us later. Um, we'll turn now to um, a presentation um, by um, Dr. Brandon Cannon and by Dr. Ash Rossiter at Khalifa University. And again, um, like uh, similar to what Dr. Hakata has done for East Asia, 
um, Dr. Cannon and Dr. Rossiter would be um, giving us the bigger geostrategic picture um, about uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific and uh, Central Asia. Over to you, please. Thanks, uh, Lee Chen, for that. Um, greetings to everybody from Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. Ash Rossiter and I are co-located together here in my office at Khalifa University. Um, we're sorry we couldn't join you in Yerevan. Uh, we do thank you, uh, Professor Sakyan, for putting this wonderful conference together. It was our plan, um, and I'm speaking about the panel here, as our plan to be in Yerevan. And unfortunately for all of us, it appears that has not worked out. So here we go um, uh, with our presentations online, which is the second best, um, but we would have loved to meet you. This panel that we put together um, uh, is, is a direct um, outcome of a special issue that uh, Lee Chen Sim and Farhad Aminjanov and I proposed to international affairs earlier this year. And, um, and, and so eventually these, these thoughts, these presentations, um, these ideas will, will hopefully end up in a journal article, although the, we've been given a slot in 2025, so it's going to take a while um, to get these out. But one of the things the journal suggested is that we present our ideas at conferences like this, and thus we're doing that. So uh, as, as Dr. Lee Chen uh, noted, Ash and I will be talking uh, on a global level here, um, more akin to what uh, Dr. Kei Hikata spoke about earlier, um, looking specifically at it through a geopolitical lens, as well as international relations lens, at the place of Central Asia in the Indo-Pacific geography of strategies. I'll turn it over to Dr. Ash Roster, and he'll begin, and I'll end our comments in a few minutes. Um, thank you very much, uh, Brendan, and, um, and great to be here virtually, and apologies um, I'm not there virtually. Um, I could apologize also for not having any, any slides, but that does avoid any technical problems that I usually encounter um, as well. So I'm going to talk very, very briefly, because I have a tendency to talk too much, um, about something reasonably unfashionable. Um, ge geopolitics and geopoliticians and and uh, and theories that are over a century old um, and what they mean for uh, what they mean for Central uh, Central Asia uh, Eurasia and the strategies of what can sometimes be labeled the Indo-Pacific states at least those states that have developed strategies around this geographical concept um, the Indo-Pacific. So our tentative paper is, is, um, is titled Rethinking Hegemony in the Heartland. And I don't probably don't need to tell many of you, um, remind many of you about this term um, heartland and where it comes from. But I, for those that may not be familiar with uh, the British geographer um, and sometime politician Harold Mackinder, um, who came up with this concept in, in 1904 in his, uh, his pivotal, uh, pivotal paper, The Geographical Pivot of History, um, which he published in 1904, um, in which he predicted um, a shift in, in world power, uh, potentially world domination by any power that could control what he called the continental pivot area. Um, roughly speaking, uh, Central Eurasia, more, more commonly known, of course, as Inner or, or, Central, or Central Asia. Um, so this concept of the pivot area or heartland, uh, a sizable region in Eurasia, roughly um, Inner Asia, um, the concept, he put, his basic premise of the theory was that um, whoever rules he uses this word, these words rule or control or conquest, and we'll discuss why these, these terms that may have been applicable um, in Mackinder's time at the beginning of the 20th century, um, we need to rethink these central concepts, but the overall, we argue, the overall theory has some, um, some well, has much utility for thinking about uh, the Eurasian uh, Eurasian landmass and its relationship with the Indo-Pacific strategies of the Indo-Pacific states still today. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and briefly build on that argument in a moment. But his, th his theory um, premised that who rules East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. 
who rules the world island commands the world, a very, um, a very simple formula. Um, and of course, ge geopolitics are a lot more complicated than that, but um, I'll briefly talk about why that holds, why we think that holds still some relevance to thinking about the, 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 the wider geopolitics of these issues today. Uh, Mackinder, Mackinder theorized that in the industrial age, the natural resources of Central Asia, the great pivot area, are so vast that it will serve as the geostrategic instrument for the state that controls it to become the empire of the world. Control of the pivot area of Central Asia and Mackinder's age provided benefits to the controller. Again, I'm using this word controller or control. These concepts need major revision as we will um, as we discuss in a lot more depth in our, in our extended paper. Um, nevertheless, the controller in terms of the region, if, if, a, if a power can control Central Asia, it has access to agricultural potential, this is in Mackinder's time at least, um, and the ability to e exploit uh, the communication links across the Eurasian landmass, um, both in terms of transportation and materials, um, and the movement of people, um, which was which was central in Mackinder's idea about a power controlling Central Asia being able to dominate the Eurasian landmass. Um, nevertheless, in many ways, Central Asia's significance still rings true in Mackinder's in, with some of Mackinder's ideas, and I'll explain why. The region features heavily in the foreign policies of the great powers. Uh, because of its natural resources um, and their desire to access or secure access to the markets in in central asia as well to those very resources that are that are um, that the region is endowed with um, but because of technological change which geopolitics is a, is a body of theory is 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 sensitive to because of technology technological change we need to rethink what, what these terms control might mean and how great powers might, um, may have their presence felt within Central Asia. And, and again, we need to emphasize that when we're talking about great powers and their involvement in, Centr in Central Asia, we are not suggesting for one moment that Central Asian states have no agency um, in what the great powers are doing. It's, it, it's more building up a, a the, um, the, the, the wider um, theoretical framework for how great powers may benefit from, um, from greater, greater, uh, greater control and this, this contested term control, um, how, they, how they may benefit from, from greater control in Central Asia. Now geopolitics as a, in terms of its theoretical contribution to IR, I would argue, um, really lies in its in the way that it has a prescriptive quality about how to balance against the prospect of a power um, becoming dominant on the Eurasian continent. And that, that, that's Mackinder and even Mahan before him, and then Nicholas Spikeman after, so the three sort of founding theorists of geopolitics, you can find in their writings a prescriptive element about what to do about this, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, in their view a bad thing to allow one power to become dominant in Eurasian, man, Eurasian landmass, um, because from that position they would be able to dominate the world, in their view. So it's a very, very prescriptive quality to, uh, to their work, which, has, um, which is relatable to, to to the Indo-Pacific strategies. And if we think about what the Indo-Pacific strategies are as a collective, they are about preventing hegemony on the Eurasian landmass. That's at, the, at their core, at the very basic, basic premise. Yes, it's maritime orientated. And at one level, it is about continuing um, trade, the, it, about, about about allowing the free flow of trade from a maritime perspective, but it's it's very anti it's very anti hege hegemonic, and that, and that at its very very basic basic level, and you can pick this up from uh, Mackinder and Spikeman. They're, they're 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 very prescriptive in in pushing 
uh, non-Eurasian landmass states to to find ways to balance against um, against the the uh, the prospect of a, uh, of a of a power dominating the Eurasian landmass. Um, so I'll turn it over to you from there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll continue and, and, and pick off where, where um, Ash left off. Uh, look, what's interesting about Central Asia and the Indo-Pacific is that it's not mentioned. In fact, I owe a deep uh, debt of gratitude to my co-editor, Kei Hakata, for raising the issue of Eurasia um, and, and really beginning to think about its place um, in particular Central Asia in the Indo-Pacific writ large in our co-edited book, which came out earlier this, uh, actually um, at the end of last year. Um, and so while we see an increased propensity for the what we term the Indo-Pacific proponent states, Japan, Australia, India, and the United States, to regularly meet together uh, as, as, as a quad or the quadrilateral security dialogue, they have thus far failed to articulate or come to terms with terrestrial, terrestrial Eurasia. Um, so the Indo-Pacific itself is a bounded concept. It is not China's BRI, which is unbounded. And it's mostly been a maritime strategy. But, but our argument here is that the more policies and actions of Indo-Pacific Indo proponent states gel in the maritime realm, the more we can expect Indo-Pacific states to iterate engagement with Central Asia. Why? Well, the maritime-driven Indo-Pacific narrative understandably tends to omit its geographical counterpart. The geopolitics of Eurasia with Central Asia at its core represent a serious conceptual and strategic challenge. If the Indo-Pacific's purpose for Japan, India, and the US remains unspoken, as, as Ash noted, it certainly entails the containment of China. Thus, for the US and Japan, this no longer means East Asia only. Rather, with the calculated inclusion of India and the Indian Ocean by former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, he was the one that first iterated this um, uh, in his Democratic Security Diamond, which I'll reference a little bit later, um, and then in the Indo-Pacific itself, it means this is truly an Indo-Pacific balance of power we're talking about. India's inclusion and its strategic continental concerns however, mean that Central Asia will become increasingly present in this debate. Geopolitics tells us this is only appropriate given the Indo-Pacific's unstated end game. And so I'm gonna conclude since we're, we're running out of time with, with um, about six uh, bullet points or thoughts that are quite ill-formed at this point, but, um, and, and perhaps purposely provocative, but I want to throw those out there for these reasons um, uh, to, to get your feedback and, and, and questions. So though the Indo-Pacific is primarily a maritime expression, the Indo-Pacific strategies of the various states are fundamentally about countering the rise of a hegemon on the Eurasian landmass, as geopoliticians a century ago would have argued as well. Second, Japan and Europe have taken disparate, but with hindsight, complementary moves over the past few years to draw closer to each other and the United States, as well as India, under the guise of the Indo-Pacific. This shows the predictive power of geopolitics when it comes to looking at or, 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 or predicting the behavior of states when systemic distributions of power are in flux in inner Eurasia. It also shows us what can go wrong should the Indo-Pacific proponents maintain their focus only on the maritime realm and ignore hegemonic ambitions in Central Asia. Third, control of this world island in, in, in Halford McKinder's speak continues to have extreme relevance on global distributions of power and the behavior of states. If we hearken back to the Cold War um, in the 1950s and 1960s, we see something similar where America was the dominant maritime power as it remains today. But look, US engagement happened across Eurasia on the periphery, from Western Europe to Turkey, to Iran, to Pakistan, to the Persian Gulf, um, as well as into Southeast Asia and Korea, okay? Um, I want to point out the importance of India in all of this. It's interesting that Mackinder failed to notice the importance of the subcontinent um, and, and, and instead named um, in his outer crescent uh, what, would, what, what would have been at the time British possessions, um, even though India was part of the, uh, of the British Raj at that point. Um, and, and I also want to point out the importance of India being 
increasingly grouped in this quadrilateral security di dialogue and quad, particularly with the United States. India's post-independence history is one of non-alignment. It is one of, of mistrust of the United States and closeness with Russia. Um, and so this shift is massive, but it's not something that was unforeseen by geopoliticians a century ago, interestingly. Um, sixth, we cannot advocate a continental commitment uh, on the size and scale of what we're seeing as ter in terms of a maritime commitment by Indo-Pacific states. And this is something Ash and I are wrestling with right now, and I know Kay has referenced this as well in his writings, is what does a continental commitment look like for the Indo-Pacific states, given that the maritime realm and maritime containment is their main goal in all of this? So these are just a couple of our thoughts um, that we want to throw out before we, before we end today. And so thanks for having us again. And I'm um, sorry our panel was, was not complete today, um, but it seems a couple of our presenters were unavailable for this. So we'll turn it back over to the chair and discussant or well, the honorary chair by default, uh, um, Lee Chen and our discussant. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so for the um, audience um, who have patiently listened to the three presentations, um, I, I thought what I'd do is I would just um, highlight uh, three uh, points which the panel has made. Um, so the first one I want to highlight is the fact that it's a, geopol it's a geopolitical as well as geoeconomic perspective of um, engagement between Central Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Um, the geopolitical components, um, Dr. K. Hakada and um, Braden and Ash have alluded to, include um, looking at Indo-Pacific Plus strategies, as well as um, strategies of looking at the extent to which the heartland concept um, continues to apply uh, today um, between these two regions. Um, the second issue which the panel has highlighted uh, would be both an outside-in perspective of engagement, so looking at how the outside powers, uh, uh, outside powers in Central Asia, so you have um, China, you have Japan, um, you also have um, uh, India, um, and of course the US, how they are trying to engage uh, Central Asia, which is the outside in perspective. Um, but um, if you've heard uh, the perspective from myself and Fahod, uh, we have tried to highlight some of the inside out perspectives of how Central Asia has um, you know, increased its level of agency to try to reach out to um, the Indo-Pacific as well. So it's both a combination of outside in and inside out perspectives. Um, the third thing I want to highlight, which this um, panel does, is that um, we contrast or compare as well the continental kind of strategies, which Braden and Ash have highlighted, with some of the more maritime-based strategies, um, which um, Dr. Hakata has also highlighted, and how Central Asia being landlocked you know, has tried to overcome um, these uh, problems of being landlocked uh, and trying to reach out to its closest um, maritime partners, but as well, you know, trying to look at the model of um, Asia and ASEAN in terms of their multilateral engagement. So um, I hope this panel has given you a kind of like a flavor of what the special issue could look like. Um, but really at this point in time, uh, we'd like to invite feedback or questions um, from the audience. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Sahakin, um, to um, administer to run the um, questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your very interesting uh, uh, panel. Uh, and uh, do we have any questions, comments here? Please, Professor Gartner, our Midas and Anahit, please. Never first, never first. <laughs> Professor Gartner, Midas, Anahit. Um, okay, uh, thank you so much for your uh, presentations. Um, I have some questions to the concepts uh, you were presenting uh, in independence. So I do see some contradictions here. So first of all, I don't really know what a rule-based order really means. So it was mentioned uh, several times by Dr. Hakata, first of all. But uh, if you uh, 
if it's a re reference to international law, actually great powers violate international law, all great powers do. So the US is blaming China, but the US didn't even, is not even part to the uh, law of the sea. Uh, Russia is violating international law in Ukraine. So I'm not so sure who defines what in, uh, rule based order uh, really is. If it is multilateralism, um, great powers use multilateralism as, as they wish. So uh, you cannot really argue that uh, one great power adheres to multilateralism and others don't. So, uh, and there's the ne next contradiction here. We have here the rule-based order. On the other hand, uh, we have this uh, well-informed debate about McKinder, Maher, and Spikeman. So uh, we have here the debate, the contradiction between rule-based order and geopolitics, because McKinder didn't really care about the so-called rule-based uh, order. So it's a very, very different uh, concept uh, here. So uh, e either it's geopolitics or it's a rule-based order. And uh, if you quote these new alliances, the court and, and the AUKUS, so it's their alliances. That's not the rule-based order. Their alliances against China. We have to be clear. And uh, the speaker has also Hakatan pointed out, Mr. Uh, Hakata pointed out that Indo-Pacific is a political term. So it emerged as an anti-Chinese concept, uh, rightly or wrongly. So we used to talk about East Asia, Central Asia. So, uh, and it well fits to these new alliances, court and, 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 and AUKUS. So we have to be uh, aware when you use this term, that's a political uh, uh, term. And uh, then the last point, uh, the geopolitical argument. So of course, of course, we can argue, have seminars after seminars about this, who is right, Spikeman or McKinner. So you were referring to Spikeman and Maher, but I'm not so sure whether uh, Spikeman would be correct. So the, the, the periphery, the, the, the rim is more important than the heartland. So after all, it was Afghanistan and the periphery of the Soviet Union, which contributed to the, fall, the downfall of the Soviet Union. So and I'm not so sure whether the Middle East, the MENA region, region, uh, the MENA region now is um, more important than the Central Asian heartland. So as a periphery, you briefly mentioned it, Iran and uh, Afghanistan and uh, the, the uh, Middle Eastern uh, states, so which is kind of periphery for this so-called heartland. So we have to be careful when we talk about heartland, whether it's not rather a periphery. But I don't have preferences. I just throw it out for debate. So that... Thank you, Professor Gartner. Dear colleagues, the floor is yours. Please, who will answer? Uh, sorry. So, Brandon, which uh, Brandon and Ash, would you like to take a stab at um, uh, answering the questions posed about the um, contradictions between uh, a rules-based order and the geopolitical concepts? Um, I'm going to turn the rules-based order question over to Kay Akata because um, I think he'll be best placed to answer that. Um, suffice to say that uh, uh, these are highly political terms. This is all about politics. Um, and and I, I think that it would be disingenuous to say that it's not. We've mentioned multiple times there's an unstated aim. And I think most of us in, in, in the room there in Yerevan and in our um, separate rooms here understand what that is. Uh, and so th th this, is, this is the gel that holds the Indo-Pacific um, or, or the Quad together, although it is not an alliance. Um, AUKUS certainly is, the Quad is not. Um, uh, we'll expect to see the Quad turn into a full-fledged alliance only if and when China does something beyond what it's doing already. Um, and so Ash and I have an entire paper on the informality of the Quad. It's an informal multilateral. Um, but that's, these, are, these are details 
Um, uh, 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 I think that 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 uh, and and overall, uh, I, I I agree with with most of your points. Um, and so the the importance of Central Asia versus say the the the, the rim itself, I, I think that what this is really an intellectual exercise and, and this is our first stab at it is, is what role does this, this inner Asia play in the Indo-Pacific, if any? And, and, um, and we've tackled this from multiple different perspectives here. We would have had um, two other presentations that would have looked specifically at what Central Asia was doing um, uh, if, if all of our panelists showed up and then, and then, and then Kay and, and, and Ash and I were going to take a look from the outside here. Um, but I'll turn it over to Kay for his, um, for his response on the rules-based order. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brandon, for the, um, uh, your briefing. Um, first, uh, the rules-based order is an idea that emphasizes the uh, respect of international law. And they, it's all about the um, rule of law uh, in international relations. Uh, take China, for example. Uh, China has built um, artificial uh, militarized islands in South China Sea, which is contrary to the rule, uh, to the um, law of the sea. Uh, of course, the United States is not party to the UN Convention on the uh, Law of the Sea, but that doesn't validate China's acts, for example. So uh, we need a great power to enforce the international law because uh, in, in uh, international relations, we don't have a centralized uh, justice, or we don't have a centralized police, so we need a, uh, a power or hegemon uh, to enforce the uh, what is uh, remaining of the international law, regardless of what you can describe the power of the United States um, in uh, one way or other. And uh, I touch also upon the question between uh, your question of the relationship between geopolitics and the um, rule of law, or the uh, rule space international order. In my thought, or in the thought of many of my colleagues of this panel, uh, these are not contradictory, um, but rather uh, geopolitics is used to uh, enforce the law. Um, because as Brendan has just said, um, there are, of course, the, uh, many uh, questions raised uh, on the uh, notion of the Indo-Pacific. But uh, when we don't have a um, centralized power, uh, we have to use uh, great power and uh, geopolitical thinking to counter the rising hegemon, uh, in particular in Eurasia. So uh, this is my brief response to the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, Mr. Midas. Yes, uh, thank you to the whole team for the presentation. Uh, my question uh, is specifically for uh, Dr. Rossiter. Uh, you mentioned the heartland theory that whoever rules the heartland uh, rules the world in the end. If I uh, look in history, uh, the one power that I can think of that uh, really ruled the heartland was uh, the Soviet Union. Still, they did not rule the world in the end. Does that disprove the heartland theory? And if not, why not? Yeah, you raise a good, you raise a good point. But um, I'm no, by, by no means am I suggesting that um, Mackinder's Mackinder's way of viewing viewing the world um, is is accurate or even even predictive. It's a it's a way of a way of thinking about the combination of the importance of geography, um, technology, and the distribution of world power. But I think um, I think with Mackinder and and Spikeman, despite their despite their differences, um, I think much of their utility, their usefulness from a from a theoretical perspective comes from um, come from their some of their prescriptions of, about um, about balance of power. 
Um, and where the heartland sits, whether it has shifted, as, as one as the previous uh, commentator noted, is um, is, a, is again a very, very, very good, uh, very, very good and important question. And, and how important is Central Asia in a, in a, in a heartland context today? Is something um, so it needs greater exploration for certain. Um, but I, but I still, I still think that um, that that the the unique contribution of geopolitics to say its balance of power conception is, is still still useful for thinking about um, about the world and whether whether a a power can actually or um, emerge on the Eurasian landmass and become world world dominant is is clearly open to question and, and it is very speculative. It still informs the actions of the Indo-Pacific states and what they're what they're doing. So it's more it's more commentary on what we're what we're seeing around us in the world and the way the states are reacting than any any attempt by me to or us to to provide policy prescription. I think we're, what we're, what we're doing is observing reaction um, against an idea that a state could dominate the Eurasian landmass and the fear that that induces, whether they, whether it actually leads to or could lead to um, any state dominating the Eurasian landmass and then being dominant in the world, it still is fear inducing, therefore it still creates reactions. And that's, I think, what we're seeing by the Indo-Pacific states in their, uh, in their attempts to, to balance. And, and what we, we, we believe we're, we're, there was still very much um, intellectually sparring over this and whether 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 we think that that will induce the Indo-Pacific strategies to onshore become a bit more continental rather than just purely maritime orientated. Um, so it's still something that we're, um, we are, we are, we are thinking about, isn't it? On a hit, please. Thank you very much for a very interesting and informative speeches. I would like to ask a question to uh, Dr. Li Chen uh, Sim and also to um, Dr. Brandon Cannon and Dr. Ash Rositer regarding the um, geopolitical strategies of the Asia Indo-Pacific uh, countries regarding to Central Asia, how do they do you see or project the geopolitics of China and India in Central Asia, and how do you see the competitiveness of them within the same um, geopolitics, the geopolitical uh, perspectives? Thank you. Okay, so um, I my was on geoeconomics mostly. So perhaps um, Dr. Hakata and um, um, Brandon, maybe you want to take that question on geopolitics of India and China. Well, it's not really our paper's topic either. Um, and so comparing uh, uh, India's India's uh, role in Central Asia with China um, is something that I'm not an expert on, uh, and and I don't make any any. Uh, I don't think that we we can make uh, judgments on that beyond basic knowledge of the fact that China seems omnipresent in Central Asia, India does not. India is making increasing forays, especially after the U.S. left Afghanistan. Um, are they are they meant to be um, rivals in Central Asia? I don't know. Uh, um, it would seem that China has the leg up on 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 India at this at this current stage. Um, much of this has to do with the sovereignty of Central Asian states and their own interests, who they choose to engage with, and that's something that um, uh, uh, Farhad and, and, and Lee Chen might be able to comment better on, but I'm sorry I've given you a, I've, I've punted the answer, so, or I've punted the, the ball. Um, Dr. Hakada, do you want to um, have any yes. response? Um, I'm not an expert on India's foreign policy either, but I can tell you that uh, of course, Indo-Pacific proponent states are disadvantaged uh, compared to China because uh, they don't have uh, direct borders uh, with Central Asian countries. And in terms of connectivity, of course, uh, these Indo-Pacific maritime states uh, don't have a leverage um, 
But um, if I can take a good example from uh, Mongolia, with which Japan has built a trusted uh, relationship since the uh, early 1990s, uh, Japan and Mongolia don't share borders, but we have a uh, human to human connectivity. And uh, I think it's important to bear in mind that connectivity doesn't necessarily mean a physical connectivity based on a, a railway or a highways, but instead Japan uh, quite intelligently built uh, connectivity with Mongolia through intellectual cooperation. Uh, for example, like in uh, Central Asia, Japan provides a lot of a technical cooperation, um, providing experts or uh, scholars who could advise uh, universities, or even uh, in case of uh, Mongolia, Japan uh, sent experts to uh, formulate uh, legislation. So many of the Mongolian legislations are as a the result of a uh, such uh, technical and intellectual cooperation. So um, I don't know if I uh, responded to the question uh, from the audience, but uh, it's a kind of a um, cooperation that a uh, remote uh, seafaring maritime state could uh, do in uh, the, 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 the domain of uh, connectivity with um, Central Asia. Thank you very much, Dr. Kata. And if I can take a stab at answering your question through um, a geoeconomic lens rather than a geopolitical lens, um, Dr. Amanjonov and myself recently wrote and uh, published a paper, an article on Central Asia's hedging strategies towards China. Uh, we looked at several um, issues, um, their success at institutional hedging, like multilateralism, uh, their success at uh, economic um, hedging, um, you know, energy diversifying relations economically, uh, etc. Uh, we also looked at the issue of um, military diversification, um, looking at how they've tried to diversify away from China and, you know, uh, away from Russia and, and towards, you know, India and some other states. Um, but we've tried to come up with in a kind of like a matrix of uh, which Central Asian states um, have been able to push back. We're not saying that they're effective hedges, but there's some of them have been more effective than others in pushing back against China. And so uh, we find that um, Kazakhstan um, has been um, rather successful because, you know, of its um, economic resources, its international outreach, it was one of the early movers. Um, one of the least successful would be um, Turkmenistan because it's, you know, it's still rather close compared to others. But others like Uzbekistan have been uh, having more success of late compared to their earlier um, iterations um, of hedging. So, um, you know, we do see a mix um, of how they've responded to China. Um, and with regards to India, um, I wouldn't presuppose to, to make a comment on that, but I would just say maybe look out for the special issue that Brandon was talking about with um, uh, international um, politics, right, um, that will come out in 2025, um, because there is um, a paper um, on India uh, in that um, special issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Chris Vensink. Um one of the speakers of yesterday. My question is for uh, Dr. Uh, Kay and perhaps also for Professor Gertner. Um, point one is that uh, in, in my view, uh, neither uh, great power today has actual actually the power to enforce international law. Uh, point two would be that all great powers uh, or, or none of the great powers, I should say, uh, has the credibility in terms of uh, living up to those standards uh, themselves. My two cents on that situation uh, that we see today is that it is a sort of a situation of, of anarchy uh, in which everybody uh, is, uh, is kind of trying to find their way in a you know, way that is best for themselves uh, and uh, which is rather chaotic. The situation we saw in, in Europe uh, as well, for instance, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, when this situation was solved, 
uh, by uh, or through the Congress of Vienna. My question would be, uh, is it time and is it uh, realistic to expect such a uh, diplomatic effort between all the great powers in uh, this day and age? I understand you addressed your question to me. Okay. Yes, um, I was just, uh, you know, trying mm -hmm. to, to provoke a little yeah. discussion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. I, 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 uh, I agree with uh, what uh, you, uh, the way you analyze the, uh, the, the state of world uh, affairs at the, uh, in anarchy, and I think anarchy is in nobody's interest. So we need to establish or shape the uh, international order. That is, that should be based on uh, the, the international law. And uh, I don't repeat my analysis that I've made um, just um, before, but um, great power is has lost a trust in many middle class. That that that's true, and the, um, even a great power like the United States or China uh, doesn't ha have a enough power or clout to enforce the, the law. That's precisely why a um, informal and the uh, flexible framework like the quad quadrilateral uh, consultation is needed. Uh, it's not all about the US Indo-Pacific strategies, but it's a combination of four like-minded uh, countries, including India, Japan, or Australia, which wish to preserve the existing rules-based international law, which the United States alone cannot, um, is not able to preserve by itself. So uh, it's a quite a challenging time for for, for the, the world and the, for the uh, uh, free world. But um, we don't have any choice. We don't have a choice to uh, work on uh, such a counter balancing um, strategies. Um, yeah. Thank you for the very. Uh challenging and, uh, as you said, provocative questions, but they're good questions. Uh, first of all, um, great powers and uh, international law, I think you're correct, great powers only uh, partially respect international law. And for those who didn't listen to my presentation uh, yesterday, I quoted this uh, relatively new study by several US uh, universities uh, that in the period of unipolarity, so after the end of the Cold War, uh, 15 years after, and uh, so it was a period with the most U.S. military intervention since 17, 1775. So there were 400 military interventions and 25% uh, were uh, conducted during this uh, unipolarity. Very few authorized by international uh, law. So it was more uh, interest than uh, international uh, law. So uh, also American political scientists came, came up in the past with the idea of the hegemonic peace. If they have a hegemon, there would be peace because there would be no challenger strong enough to uh, challenge the, the uh, hegemonic power, uh, but it proved wrong because especially during the time of unipolarity, we didn't have peace. We, we no, know these cases, of course, uh, uh, anyway, so Balkan wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, then, uh, yeah, so um, Libya. So enforcing that one uh, hegemonic power is enforcing international law for the sake of the international law is just wrong. So that's uh, that's once in a while, yes, once in a while, of course, uh, once in a while, and especially if another 
great power violates international law, which happens pretty uh, frequently. Uh, second, second question, I was referring to this uh, yesterday as well about the uh, Vienna uh, Congress. It worked in the uh, Vienna Congress after the uh, Napoleonic War, 15, 1815. So the great powers would sit down and say, we need an international order, which is based on common norms, but also on the balance of power. So that means no state should be stronger than all the others together. The very simple definition of uh, balance, balance of power. Of course, there, in, in, in the colonies, there were no rules. So the, were, most of them were colonial states and they intervened in the, but there was peace a hundred years, except this period in the middle of the century with the Crimean War and, and the universal unification. Uh, Austria, uh, Italy, Germany, France, Germany, Austria, all this was we, uh, we had in this uh, period, but it somehow worked. So, of course, it not necessarily needs to work now, uh, but it is a concept that we uh, uh, can look at. But the alternative, what we are seeing now, we, of course, it would be uh, open up at about the U Ukraine war, but what we are seeing now is that we will have a cordon sanitaire from uh, the Arctic down to the uh, Black Sea. So where the troops are, there will be a new Iron Curtain right through Ukraine. So this Iron Curtain cordon sanitaire will stay for decades, much longer than Putin is in power. So if we want avoid to avoid for the next generation to live with the new Iron Curtain as we live through, uh, we have to find concepts to avoid this. And uh, Vienna Congress is one of the concepts I referred yesterday to another one, which led to the uh, detente or was part of, part of the detente policy between the blocks at the Helsinki uh, final accords of 75 at the height of the Cold War, is that common security is more important than, uh, than uh, confrontation, cooperative security and security is indivisible. Uh, but I don't want to uh, expand on this, but that's uh, another concept. Of course, it not necessarily uh, work out. We might have a new iron curtain. So that's maybe it's more likely even so. But if the Europeans do not think about the alternatives, so we have to live with, with it. Thank you. And the last question, Mr. Morris, please. Thank you. Is that working? Yes. Uh, look, thank you very much. I think we've heard an interesting presentation of this idea. I want to be provocative as well. Uh, I made a, a point yesterday that uh, Francis Fukuyama's belief that history had ended 30 years ago didn't age very well. And I want to suggest that re resurrecting the ideas of Mackinda, which were shown for the last century not to be very valuable and were actually very much out of fashion after they were embraced by Nazi Germany, resurrecting the ideas of, of, of one power being the hegemon uh, may not actually age well either. I, I suspect that we're heading into a period of multipolarity. And so this attempt to build a discourse about surrounding China, containing China, is actually, as you quite openly uh, concede, is, is about maintaining US hegemony. Now, many of us welcome US hegemony. We welcome the US as a balancing power. But my question is this, I mean, when we go beyond balancing, and when we try and imagine that we can have one hegemonic power, what actually is the end game? Because when you have rising powers such as China, do, do we really expect that we're going to have a confrontation with China? Or might we not learn some lessons from the last decades in which arguably, in the Asia Pacific, which is a term we're not allowed to use anymore, the Asia Pacific was a great example of peace and of interdependence and of mutual respect between countries. Actually, the rise of China occurred peacefully largely. Of course, China has contravened international law in the South China Sea, and as has been pointed out, other great powers regularly contra contravene <coughs> international law as well. So I'm not in any way justifying the actions that China takes that are coercive and, are, and that are unwelcome. But surely there is an alternative to just a confrontational strategy. Surely the decades of history since 
the rise of all of the East Asian economies in the post-war era is a lesson that we should not be uh, uh, heading towards hegemonic clashes at all. We'll, we'll just be repeating the Second World War and, and earlier clashes. We should actually be learning the lessons of interdependence. And surely the countries of Asia uh, re uh, represent this. Now, of course, Japan, Australia, South Korea will bandwagon with the US. They have, they have obvious uh, reasons to do so. But the rest of Asia doesn't buy into this discourse. So this is a discourse that's coming from Washington, supported very much from Tokyo and Canberra, but it is not supported. It is not welcomed in the rest of the region. So if we're trying to impose an Indo-Pacific strategy of encircling China, but the rest of the region doesn't buy it, it seems to me this discourse is not going to age very well. We're going to look back on this in 30 years' time and say, gee, that was a bit misguided, wasn't it? Because actually, in the, in the Asia-Pacific region, there needs to be some settlement, some, some agreement that countries live together uh, and, and work together and maintain their deep interdependence that has been so successful and so peaceful. So if we're heading to confrontation, we're kind of undoing that. Now, the Indo-Pacific came out of the Trump years. I think I'll end there. I'm going to take a first stab at that, if that's okay. Um, so, look, uh, it's interesting that you're saying this doesn't have much traction in the rest of Asia. Um, and I, I think we need to be clear again. Ash said this, I thought, quite clearly. Um, we're not resurrecting Mackinder because Mackinder's right. What's interesting about Mackinder and, and Spikeman is that they predicted how states were going to react if a hegemon were rising in Eurasia. That's it. And this Indo-Pacific outlooks or strategies or policies are now common from the North Atlantic, right, um, to include Germany having one of all states, on down through India. It has quite a bit of traction in Delhi, by the way. Interestingly, a state that, as I mentioned, has had a long history of mistrust in the United States. How do you drive India into the arms of the United States is anybody's good question. I think we know the answer why, right? And sure, ASEAN is concerned about its centrality, and so it's lukewarm on this. That's very clear, but there's a reason why this is happening. And that in the, in the, and while uh, the points are well taken that, that great powers um, don't just uphold international law because of international law, they do so because of their interests. Well, it's very much in the US's interest right now, as it is in Japan's and Australia's, as you mentioned, to uphold what was this rules-based order that developed out of Pax Americana at the end of World War II. And so it's in their interest to do so right now. The idea of the Indo-Pacific did not begin under the Trump administration. Um, uh, as, as Kay can tell you even better than me, this developed from Tokyo back in 2006 and seven with Prime Minister Abe's first forays to Delhi, first of all, to get the Indians on board and only then to bring the United States on board. And while it was stillborn for about 10 years, and yes, the Trump administration did run with it, this is very much an idea that was hatched in Tokyo and the Japanese drove this um, uh, in, in particularly in the form of uh, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for 10 years before it gained traction. I think the traction speaks for itself. I would hope it ages badly, to be honest with you, because that means it, didn't, it, it doesn't have a purpose. But I'm afraid right now it does have a very powerful purpose and a very potent purpose, right? And, and, and um, Ash and I have said in other papers about the Quad, if you ask the question, who drives the Quad? Well, China does. And so the actions of China or the non-actions of China um, give the quad its relevance or its irrelevance. And I'll end there. Thanks for the questions, it was great. Hirol, thank you very much. I want to thank you, Dr. Li Chen Sim, Dr. Farhot Amijanov, and Dr. K. Hakata. And special thanks go to Dr. Brendan Kennan for uniting this panel in this conference. Thank you very much for your great speeches. And please also do not forget about our book project, one, one of the main aims of this conference. I'm saying it for all attendees. It is our book project. So let's keep contact and let's move uh, to our next.